Maiden McCullen, welcome to the Innovation Show. Stay hungry, stay foolish. So now on the Innovation Show, it's a great honor to welcome marketing guru, TED speaker and author of so many fantastic books, Seth Golden. Welcome to the show, Seth. Well, thank you so much for having me. I love being on Irish radio. It's a special place. I was talking to you before the show about how to hone this down into a conversation because it's so, so wide spanning, so many nuggets of information that you've shared with your daily blog, with the amount of books you've done, your audio books, your TED Talks, that to hone it down is, is quite difficult. But one of the books that I, I love, and I'm going to start with innovation, I suppose, is Lynchpin and the mindset of Lynchpin and actually just shipping products, not being fearful, standing out from the crowd to be a heretic and not be afraid of, of being a heretic. And that comes from tribes. And uh, I'd love to just talk to you about the, fa- the fact of, of how to be that within a company. How do you suggest somebody might start to be a heretic or or a change maker i think we gotta go a few steps back uh not too far from where you are is manchester england where the industrial revolution really caught steam if i may and the deal which was put into place 140 years ago 120 years ago was that if you did what you were told you would get ahead that if you did what you were told the company would take care of you and as Clay Shirky has pointed out, in, in the 1880s in Manchester, they didn't have coffee bars. They had gin carts that went up and down the streets all day long because so many people were alcoholics. It was so hard to shift from being an independent thinker, a farmer, who worked on his own schedule outdoors, to going into a building for 10 or 12 hours a day and doing what you were told. But we bought it. We bought it. And we bought it in the UK. We bought it in Ireland. We bought it around the world. And my argument is the deal's off. That if you work for a company that says we are going to succeed by complying better than any other company, they're lying to you. And we have seen what's happened to the organizations that are built around compliance. They have faded and sputtered and failed. The opportunity, my argument goes, is that at the top of the organization, but also within the organization, we need truth tellers and leaders and the people I will call linchpins. These aren't people who succeed because they obey. They are people who succeed because we would miss them if they were gone, because they contribute something that is beyond competence. And if we can't begin by agreeing that that is needed, then all of my ideas about how to get there are worthless. But I'm hoping Now it's, you know, 10 years since I wrote Tribes. I'm hoping that it's starting to resonate with people as they see the creative destructions going on all around us and industries turned over, that the deal is broken and that it's up to us to make a new deal. It's interesting that one of the the challenges is the company allowing that. So if if you're a linchpin or a, a wannabe linchpin, within a company and you go and you behave like the maverick or the heretic or the change maker and the company suppresses you. What, what's your recommendation in that respect? Well, I'm going to begin by saying that in almost every case where I've looked into this, that fear is nonsense. Uh, if you work at one of the rare companies that doesn't want someone who cares, that doesn't want someone who gives above and beyond, that isn't looking for someone with emotional intelligence, then you just got a great wake-up call that you should leave immediately. Because there are a number of companies that want someone who does have those attributes is huge and growing fast. What's really happening, though, is that people tell themselves the company doesn't want that because they're afraid. It gives them an excuse to hide. What they're basically saying is, my boss won't let me. Well, of course your boss won't let you because what you're saying to your boss is, I want to do all this cool stuff. And if it doesn't work, it'll be your fault because you said I should try it. And if it does work, I'll get the credit because I did it. Well, who would take that deal? It's a lousy deal to the boss. So the answer is A, 
not to begin with huge bet everything innovations, but to begin with the smallest possible steps. And two, to do it without authority, to do it with the willingness to take responsibility. That if you take responsibility for the things that go wrong, but you give the boss credit for everything that goes right, I'm pretty sure you will discover that they ask you to do it again. There's so much cross-pollination between your books, and you can see your mindset across all the books. Because in tribes, you, you talk about this, that you build a tribe, a small tribe, that can have an output or a positive input into the rest of the company. But you've got to start, and you've got to just get off your ass and start. Yeah, I mean, so many simple little examples. What would happen to your career if you started a book club at work where every week you and 10 people in your spare time read a book about marketing, business, process, something, right? Would you get fired for that? I think that's extremely unlikely. If only three people joined, would that be worth it? Probably. And if day after day, week after week, you grew this circle of people who thought big thoughts and asked hard questions, would that make the organization a better place to work? Of course it would. So why aren't you doing it? It's not because your boss won't let you. It's because you've been seduced into thinking that your job is to be competent. Your job is not to be competent. Well, I suppose what I was getting at is there are companies that exist that will want you to be compliant. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old boy, and I want them to be free thinkers, and I don't want them to be conditioned to go, this is the way you must do things. That's right. And so the job of the parent is really difficult because we say we want our kids to stand out. We say we want to raise free-range kids who explore. But when push comes to shove, we push them to fit in. We push them to get on the rugby team. We push them to do what they're told and, and not to be the victim of a bully or the scolding of the cool kids um, because we want to take care of our kids. But the fact is that training kids to memorize things no longer makes sense because anything worth memorizing is worth looking up on the internet. And that instead what we need to do is train our kids to have an internal narrative that encourages them to say and do the right thing. And, and it's like you said, emotional intelligence, empathy. I had a refresher on Lynchpin over the weekend, what you said about being the differentiator, being that customer service guy being the guy in the taco stand who says good morning Seth every morning knows what you have what you're having before you even get there knows that you were missing and he's like Mr. Golden you must have been on holidays that guy stands out in a world that's coming down the line with AI that's replaceable road tasks that will be replaced by artificial intelligence or some systematic change the outlier will have to stand tall in that world Exactly. And yet, we respond by tweeting the way everyone else tweets, writing roundup posts the way everyone else does, by being a freelancer just like everyone else is a freelancer, by trying to understand what everyone is talking about and talking about that. You know, the this is not our future. Our future belongs to the person who uh, travels to the beat of a different drummer. With that in mind, can we talk about your career and, and how you started? Because it's a fascinating story, but also when you kind of know, and this is why I kind of, I suppose, structured the interview this way to go, this is kind of set today, but the set that started off uh, back in the day with your own agency, etc. Can we talk about that story? Like, because you obviously were an outlier all the time and you thought differently and you backed yourself and you weren't fearful. And it'd be great to understand the story. Well, uh, forgive me for disagreeing a little bit. I don't think that I was an outlier in many ways. I went to the same public school as everybody else. And uh, in the U.S., that's what we call the school that anyone can go to. Um, and, you know, I went to college with everybody else. When I started, I was filled with fear. And I have been uh, dancing with that fear all along. I think we let ourselves off the hook too easily if we describe somebody who's doing interesting work as different from us. I don't think that's the case. Um, you know, I have failed more than almost anyone I know, and that failure is one of the 
key elements of my success. Uh, do I see the world differently? Well, I think what I do is I see the world uh, in a non-standard way, but unlike many people, I speak up about it. That there's nothing stopping people from publishing their work online. It's free. There's nothing stopping people from organizing the folks around them. It's free. There's nothing stopping people from putting ideas into the world that don't work. But most people don't do that. I did it fairly early because I was impatient. My parents encouraged me. But, you know, at the beginning, I wasn't seen by anybody as being gifted at this. I was just failing more than they were. And I don't want to let people off the hook because I don't think I'm special. It reminds me of the Michael Jordan quote about, you know, he, he, he succeeded because he took more shots than anyone else. And uh, <laughs> there you go. So, uh, yeah, no, and I love that mindset and, and company, I think companies are getting there. They're certainly talking the talk about fail and fail quickly and all that kind of stuff and try small MVPs all over the place. And, you know, some of them will fail and that's okay. But when we move to a world where that's becoming the, the only way it is, we really welcome that world. How did you get into marketing? When I was in high school, I was an entrepreneur. And the thing about being a tiny sized entrepreneur is you have to do your own marketing. So to get people to sign up for my ski club in high school, I had to figure out how to get people to sign up for my ski club in high school. <laughs> and then when I was in college, I started a few uh, student run businesses we had a travel agency and a ticket bureau and a snack delivery service and a bunch of other things each time trying to figure out how to get college students to pay a dollar for a bagel, how to get college students to pay $10 to go see a concert. Um, and that teaches you an intuitive money free form of marketing, which it turns out is what most people do now. Uh, then I met Jay Levinson, the guy who wrote guerrilla marketing and I wrote four of his books with him. Uh, and realized that this wasn't a short-term thing and it wasn't just for small companies. Uh, I was a book packager. I came up with ideas for books. And in 1992, before the World Wide Web, I started a company called yo, -Yo Dine that invented commercial email as we know it. And so you got to get uh, one big hit in your career if you're lucky, and that was mine. My timing was excellent. I ended up joining uh, Yahoo when they bought the company in 99. So for seven years, we were on the cutting edge of helping big companies not spam everybody. Yeah. And we, you know, we were loud and clear about spam being evil. Um, and I'm really delighted and surprised that email has persisted this long as the key engine of online commerce to this day, but that's because of work that Ted Rubin and uh, Mark Hurst and Jerry Sharshevsky and David Simon and me and others did to sort of pioneer what it meant to engage with customers who wanted to hear from you. Yeah, and, and that's, that led to permission marketing. And that, that was about this non-spamming of customers. That's right. And the book is still, I haven't updated it on purpose because I wanted people to see how I was thinking 18 years ago. Uh, and I'll, there's a little too much emphasis on games and, and uh, significant measurable uh, benefits to the consumer. But I think we have seen uh, from Google to Groupon to Pinterest uh, to Reddit and on forward that these are companies that embrace the ideas in that book. What I love is what you said there, but it's it's lasted all this time in that it's still relevant. And another book which you wrote is Meatball Sunday, and, and I I bought this book for so many CEOs and people who asked me for help with their digital marketing. I go read that, and then let's talk because, like, let's talk about Meatball Sunday because I, I use an analogy on this show so many times that our listeners are probably sick of hearing me talking about, but uh, the idea of my company being selling meatballs as its staple product and then i go oh digital digital's come along and all of a sudden i throw on a bit of uh, a bit of whipped cream and some hundreds and thousands and a few cherries on top and i have this disgusting product that's false and it's still it's still widespread uh, set and i just find that fascinating that 
so many marketers outsource their brains and, and Clayton Christian talks about this Clayton Christensen is that they've outsourced their opportunity to learn and then the agencies become stronger and they become weaker and then you have this disgusting product that the ultimately the, the user or the audience suffer from yeah there's something fundamentally broken about the relationship of most brands with their agency and the relationship works like this here's what we make we make it efficiently the factory knows how to do it here's some money please get people to buy what we make well ad agencies thrived for a long time because TV ads were too cheap. That if you could buy TV ads for less than they were worth, all you had to do is buy a lot of TV ads and you were going to do fine. But now TV ads aren't too cheap. That kind of interruption marketing doesn't pay the way it used to. But there's a lot of smart people left at ad agencies. What we ought to be saying to those smart people isn't come up with a clever ad. What we ought to be saying to them is, Come up with a clever company. Come tell us what to make next. Come teach us how to behave. You know, so if you think about a company like Volkswagen, I think any ad agency in the world would have said to Volkswagen, don't lie about emissions. And that one bit of advice would have been worth more than all the Volkswagen ads in history put together. Yeah. Because what we do is more important than what we talk about. And what we ought to be able to say if we have a factory up and running is we made a different product and the product itself is the marketing. You know, a company like Uber isn't transforming transportation because they have a good logo. They have a stupid logo. They're transforming marketing because they changed what they made. And if you change what you make, the advertising changes, takes care of itself. Yeah. And it's something that you see in, in digital marketing so much in even the product. So they'll, half invest in user experience or user interface and not even measure the data, the behavioral analytics through heat mapping or whatever, and instead pour that money into bringing people to a, a crappy product that they just come to and they go, this is crap, I'm out of here. And like a, that, that mindset of your product is your marketing it is resonant throughout all your books. And I just find it fascinating, Seth, that you know, you've written some of these books, Tribes 10 years ago, Meatball Sunday around the same time, that they, st like, that's a playbook. That's a playbook that you can pick up and go, okay, well, I'm just going to follow this and be authentic and be myself and say I made mistakes and admit those mistakes and maybe even make those mistakes into content that I can then use to, to market my product even further. But I wanted to ask you, said about this, was the, the rise of ad blocking is huge here in Europe and it's going, sure. to, it's going to get worse and worse. And what your take on that world is? Well, the first thing is why is anyone surprised? If you're busy running ads that people want to block and people can block the ads, why are you surprised that they will? It's not surprising to me at all. So, you know, the, uh, the idea is advertising on the web has always been flaky it's been an edge case. No one sits there through an ad waiting for it to be over. They just click to another site. And that's different than TV, where we used to say, well, I got to sit through this ad to watch the rest of my show. And there have been a lot of smart people who have worked hard to get ads that we don't notice or get ads that uh, we won't skip. But there's something fundamentally broken here which is that advertising by its nature of this sort is interrupting people you didn't expect to hear from when they have a message you don't want to hear. Yeah, We can't build an economy on that anymore. TV was a magical moment, but it's over. So instead, what we have to do is sell to our customers, not to strangers. We have to make a product that they want to hear about. We have to turn strangers into friends before we turn friends into customers. We have to deliver anticipated, personal, and relevant messages that people want to get. If we do those things, ad blockers aren't a problem. Like even if from your own perspective, I mean, you sell yourself because you are the product essentially. But like anything you touch almost has a Midas touch because of the authenticity of, of your content that you provide in your daily blog. I mean, 
It's phenomenal. I mean, you answered an email to me to, to do the show. And, and I did. I emailed you a long time ago when you were putting out for your app. You were looking for a provider for your app. And, and I said, I'll, I'll build it for you. And you, you answered and said, thanks. Uh, I have a supplier, which was Jacob's Media. Don't mind giving the guys a plug. And I just thought you walk the talk. So you do what you actually say you, you will do. And you endeavor to answer your emails, all that kind of stuff. Like, so advertising as a product so as a media company my lifeblood now because my press the printing press is dead or is on its way or will become like vinyl in the very near future or if it hasn't already and now i'm in a in an arena where there's no barriers between a blog and a, a journalist and in, in a lot of cases the, the the blog has so much authenticity and truth and uh, passion behind it because that's I'm doing that in my spare time, and how can the how can the media publication survive in a world where a uh, the product is becoming the advertising or b the 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 product team are creating their own podcast or their own uh, their own advertising through their own blog, and there's going to just be less and less slices of the pie for everyone. Well, I think there's room for media companies if they can keep innovating on how they define media and come up with things that an individual can't do easily on their own. So the seventh biggest book publisher in the United States uh, also runs conferences that as many as 15,000 people come to in a stadium. Now they get, uh, I believe, 20% of their revenue from these events. And my expectation is that one day it'll be 100%. You can't run a 15,000 person event in a stadium by yourself. But the tribe wants to meet itself. The tribe wants to come together. The people who want to reach the tribe want them to come together. So everyone benefits from this transition from we own scarce TV spectrum or we have a printing press to we're the organizer of the tribe. And if you're the organizer of the tribe, you don't need nearly as much money and nearly as much as many people as you did when you were a giant organization. But there's no reason to think it's not a valuable place to be. So let, let me talk in, in a more general case. Uh, do you have uh, Top Man in Ireland or sure, Justin? Yeah. Okay. So let's think about their dilemma. They are competing against the Walmarts and the Amazons and the cheapest people in the world. They have to run ads. They have to build stores. They have to do all sorts of uh, stuff to get a new customer like me. So I was uh, having a party for a friend a couple weeks ago. I ordered uh, a bunch of straw hats for everyone at the party to wear. That's a big win for top men. They spend a lot of money to get that interaction to occur. So then what they do, because they're racing to the bottom, is they dumped the hats into a plastic bag with no box and no padding and just mailed it to me. So the hats arrive completely crushed and I, they're useless. So I email the address on the receipt and 10 minutes later, I get a note back saying, we usually answer emails within three days. Well, four days later, I get an email saying, we're way behind. We probably won't get to you for two weeks. And so they don't answer their email. So then I call the phone number on the receipt and they don't answer their phone. And I get a recording that says, we're having trouble. We're not answering our phone and they hang up on me. So here's what they did. What they did was they went to all the trouble to build an organization, but then because they thought their job was to be cheap, they went in a race to the bottom. But people who buy stuff aren't interested in the cheapest. They're interested in the best for the money. And if everything's the same, then they want the cheapest. Yeah. But as soon as you start cutting off your nose to spite your cheap face, then you're on a race to the bottom. And they're going to lose because they won't be able to afford to interrupt new people, to get new customers. They had somebody, me who they could have figured out how to delight and engage. And then they would have had me again, way cheaper, way, way, way cheaper than it would have cost them to get someone else to take my place. And it's incredible that that, that is still happening in, in today, like in today's world, that those experiences are still happening despite all the, you know, the, the literature. I mean, there's nobody reading any marketing manuals there because like the unboxing as well should be absolutely pleasurable. The, the whole experience end to end. And we, you know, we often talk about Steve Jobs and Apple here, 
that the end to end product from the marketing to the to the stores to the unboxing to the delight of the product and the to being able to just plug it in and play and the the feeling of of uh, competence that comes with that is just missing at so many times and and with retail when you see in so many stores closing throughout the states and and Amazon actually becoming the re- the physical retailer now you just think that how can they survive with that mindset you know Aiden the thing is that it's not a single misguided individual it's a mistake about who you're working for and what the time frame is so if we look at a company like Apple Apple hasn't launched a delightful new experience in more than two years um, that Apple works for the shareholders, but mostly it works to make the short-term stock price go up. And that means that they're focused on the short-term, and if they can shave a nickel or if they can put something in the software that leads to more money, not more delight, they have done it. And it's pretty clear that they can't do that forever. They could have been an innovator forever, but they can't do this forever, milking the cow. And sooner or later, they will no longer be able to please the short-term people. And the same thing is true with most retailers. Retailers say, well, we're under all this pressure. We have to pay our landlord. We have to pay our investors. So therefore, we're going to go down the short-term path. And we can see it coming, people like you and I, because we're in on the outside. We don't see the pressure. We just see the mistake. But This is where creative destruction comes in, is that people make what seems like a rational decision to go after the short term, and in the long run, they're doomed. And when you compare that to Jeff Bezos and Amazon and just the 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 belligerence to not give shareholders stock because he knows it's like a, a drug that they'll give them he'll give them a bit and then they'll just want more 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 and he just keeps betting on new futures all the time. Is that is that what you feel? Yeah, I mean, I think that. The the brilliance that Jeff brought to Amazon is he didn't make it the fastest, cheapest place by telling people to hurry up and work for less. He made it the fastest, cheapest place by changing the process itself. And if you change the process, then you can still take care. You know, in the U.S., Amazon is rated as one of the most trusted, most beloved brands. But they're also the cheapest. That's a miracle. That's yeah. really hard to do. They did it by coming up with new processes, not by pushing people to be half the price. Yeah, and and processes, like innovation in work processes and and how do we do this more efficiently, not yeah, not drive people too much because there's been a bit of negative press over this side of of the water about that. But like, I mean, they're constantly innovating everything. And I was an early adopter of Amazon buying CDs and books and when I think of the journey from then to where it is now, and you can see just, you can see the process and the packaging is, is like you talk about the a- a- Apple unboxing. It's the same with a, with a cheap book. It just, it's just bang, open up, nicely presented and the receipt is there. And it's, ju- you can just see that, like it's just end to end within the company to drive those processes. Right. The company's run by process. The, the number of people, who are book, are book buyers at a place like Barnes and Noble, or uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of a UK brand off the top of my head, compared to at Amazon, is dwarfed because Amazon doesn't rely on human taste. It, it it's not up to the buyer; it's up to the system, and so the system drives a ton of stuff that they don't have to hire talented people to do because it's all about the system. Amazon is organized to sell everything. They're not organized to sell a thing. That's been the beauty, isn't it? I mean, they set up the process for books, then went sideways incrementally into CDs, and then more and more and more, and the, the desire just to take over the whole thing. And what's your feel on, on the almost reverse of the the retail store, so the, the physical retail store, and now Amazon has actually put a, basically a showcase uh, of a yeah, store? Yeah, that's just a publicity stunt. Okay, so well, listen, I, I, I'm conscious of your time. I, I said 30 minutes, and, and uh, I'm going to stick to that promise. And huge thank you for your time and joining us on the show. And w- have you any books coming out soon or anything like that? Well, you know, my book, What to Do When It's Your Turn, is in its fifth printing now, and you can only get it online at yourturn.link. Uh, and uh, I am not doing any 
new book writing, but always special little projects here and there. People can find them on my blog. And the manifestos, of course, that are, that are all free on the blog as well. Thank you, sir. Seth Golden, uh, thank you for joining us. Be well. Go make a ruckus, Aiden. Thanks, man. See you. So now on the Innovation Show, we welcome Pete Dice, Technical Director for DCU Alpha. Welcome to the show, Pete. Thanks very much. Good to be here, Aiden. So uh, w- w- I thought we'd talk about hackathons, Pete, because um, it's something that it's where we met, actually, was at a, a, a DAA, Dublin Airport hackathon um, yeah. a few couple of months back now. And uh, I was just intrigued um, by the, the focus that you get out of that on yeah. a problem. The, the combined focus and uh, so let's let's talk about like your your take on hackathons the value sure. of them etc sure well um we've done about a dozen of them now at dcu over the years um when i was started uh with with uh, with intel here um uh talking with ronan furlong and and breen mccraw out at dcu um it it was a natural fit and there was there was another company involved uh pch uh liam casey's company that was doing uh hardware hackathons which really fit into what what where intel was heading uh and and the more we got into it the, the more it became apparent that it's not just something which you would do you know for for pr uh, for 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 Intel or for another MNC, there's there's a lot of common good that can come out of it, that that I believe is is really relevant today, um, and and Ireland offers a lot of opportunity for a, a, a mix of functionality uh, that you wouldn't normally get in the work in, in inside the workplace. Um, if you look at the people who come to them, a lot of them are are tinkerers, inventors, geeks, but there's also artists and there's uh, experts in the field that provide some mentorship. Uh, but but overall, you can get uh, you know a, a man year worth of R and D um, in a weekend when you have 120 people who are focused on a on a particular problem or set of problems for an industry or for a city uh, uh, or for a, a sector in a city like sanitation or health or whatnot. Um, and uh, we we got we got a great deal out of it, a, a lot of personal satisfaction, but but also there there was quite a bit of good that came came of it. Um, uh, and uh, even if even if we didn't lend to something which was a turnkey solution off the back of it, which would which would yield immediate really uh, some kind of result for the company or for the city, it, it's something where it really pushed the ideas forward, um, and then it would lead to further research and development or uh, other commercial activities off the back of it um we we also experimented with with uh actually fostering uh new companies coming out of it new startups and we had a small uh amount of success with that uh dcu offers uh a, a bit of space right so so they'll offer office space for for some of the the startups which come out of it but um you you the, the one thing which we were we, we were noticing is, is you can't push it right. You can't demand people to innovate. You have to have a certain amount of play and a certain amount of whimsy in it. Um, and and when you do that, you really get the spark of creativity, which becomes infectious. And not only does it take place at the event on the weekend, but it also spills over into the rest of the week, you know, and 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 a few weeks after that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, overall, there's there's huge returns off the back of it. I used to call them forced fun days where, you know, you, you, a company will go off to an adventure park for a weekend, they'll talk strategy and everybody will get excited and then nothing happens as a result. But the hackathons is a, a central focus where everybody's energy is pointed at the same problem and going, we need to solve this problem. And from what I saw was with the Dublin Airport team and John Hurley uh, from, from Dublin Airport was, they were very, very clear on what the problem was they were like here's the problems they did their research on their side oh, as yeah. the enterprise and i'm sure that has a massive bearing on the results it does it absolutely does so so uh if if a if a company or organization is wanting to to sponsor one of these events you know they have to put themselves forward um uh the the airport teams right either either from the customer side right the passenger side or from the the, the airfield side what you don't see uh, which goes on on a regular basis at the airport, they really brought their problems forward, which was very uh, 
eye opening for for all the contestants and and the contestants who were who were there the participants took it to heart uh, and 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 they really dedicated themselves to those problem statements on on the weekend there was there were uh, people who wanted to instrument trucks to make it easier for for emergency teams and for maintenance teams to be able to get the heavy equipment out uh, when they needed to on time uh, and then there was uh, other people who were looking at you know different airport apps which wound up being uh, uh, a call for a new website to be built for the airport to make it more usable and and and, and more passenger friendly and help the passengers through uh, the, the the airport in in a timely manner and and to be good passengers as well to show up at the airport on time and you might get a free coffee on the way through you know s- simple things like that really do yield uh, a, a lot of efficiency and, and, and effectiveness for operations at that airport but also for the for the community that that's that's using the airport one of the main things that has to come out of that is that they don't just drop it the company that pay say invests in the hackathon that it's not a case of just ticking a box as you said the pr because because that hopefully those days are gone i know there's going to be some companies who do it purely for cosmetic aesthetic reasons but the ones that take that learnings take it back to the company go okay now we put an action plan or we put some money behind these ideas we bring them on further must see massive dividends paid it is and um i've i've seen uh companies take two or three ideas back and in some cases hire the participants as consultants after and and it's also a great uh uh, hiring uh opportunity for 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 these sponsors as well because (laughs) you actually get to see the the potential teams who you might want to hire perform. Now, a lot of folks who are coming are weekend warriors, right? They have their day jobs and they're set and they're not going to go after it. Um, and they are just out for a bit of crack on the weekend, you know, putting down, you know, 20 or 40 euros, you get free food for the weekend. You're in with a bunch of geeks who are very much like you. You also have other functions there like design and, and business people who can, you know, add value to what you're doing from a, a technical point of view or vice versa um, and really bring these things forward quickly. It's, it, it winds up being very rewarding for, the, for, for both the participants and for those uh, folks who choose to sponsor. For folks listening who don't know about technique or the the format of a hackathon, how does a common one? I know they all vary, Pete, but how, how do they? How do you see a, 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 a normal hackathon play out? Well, it 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 starts probably two three months in advance of when the event happens. Um, uh, you know, the the organization has to approach the the D, DCU in in this case, um, and uh, present the ideas of what they want to bring forward and some of their problem statements and, and what they're hoping to achieve. And, and it has to be reasonable, right? Like you can't change the world in a weekend. Now you can start to change the world in a weekend. Um, uh, and then, and then also it, it does take a certain amount of, uh, of pre-work for the technical teams to make sure that you have the right um, widgets on the day for people to build off of, right? You don't want to be bringing a, uh, a bunch of sensors to something which needs a bunch of apps yeah. or vice versa. So uh, you also have to make sure that you have a, a, a cloud provider because the Internet of Things is big, but in order for the Internet of Things to work out and not just to have a, a little local embedded device that works great locally, but it doesn't really unleash the power that you can with you know communications and a bit of extra data and data analysis. So you, you have to have all these pieces in place, and that normally takes a few workshops, um, and then as you start to move forward uh, to the event, there's, there, there's a lot of advertising that has to happen um, inside the, the networks of um, participants uh, and then also in the field which the, which the sponsors are, are going to be pursuing. Right? So you have to target all the, those pieces well ahead of time. A lot of people will, will register for the event a, a few weeks ahead. And then they'll show up on the day and things should magically work. But there's a lot of forethought that goes into it. Um, on the day, though, uh, what we normally do is we have a few uh, uh, speakers from the, the organization or, or from the, the, the ecosystem uh, or, or sector, right? So, so you might have uh, you know, the head of the Dublin City Council or you might have the CEO or, or CTO or, or other from the organization that's helping to sponsor it. Um, and then uh, maybe some some quick demos of some of the ideas uh, which they're trying to, or, or should I say, problem statements they're they're trying to resolve. Um, 
Now, that that starts it, and that's normally a few hours on a Friday night. And then um, the participants line up after about a half hour of thinking it over, and they'll start to pitch their ideas. And the ideas which are being driven during the weekend are coming from the participants. So it's really a, a crowdsourced um, uh, uh, ideation activity on the Friday. Uh, and then um, after we have about 30 of those run through, we'll sit down and we'll go through uh, uh, a voting round uh, with all the participants getting a vote. So it's very democratic um, activity. Now we do try to, to, to steer a bit um, from a from a curation point of view to make sure that you know we we will get something which is going to be realizable after three days um, but normally uh, at the end of three days you'll have 12 sometimes 10 uh, real prototypes that someone can take forward either either as a potential business on their own or something which wraps back into the organization's uh, flow of, of products or, or services so um, during during the Friday, the teams form. On Saturday, the, the teams come back and they start to, to do the design. Um, they'll do the hardware design, the software design, the business plans. Um, on the Saturday afternoon, they really kick it into gear and they'll be there until 2 in the morning on the Saturday. Um, there's normally some mentoring sessions that happen uh, so that we, we have, you know, like for uh, Dublin, we had sanitation folks and people from fire and people from healthcare. Uh, come in from the airport, as, as as I was mentioning, from DAA. We we had the teams who who work on the on the tarmac, and in the in the different services that that um, you know help people through the airport and whatnot. Um, so we make those teams available, and then on the Sunday uh, when they come in, they're they're finishing things up. If there's anything that has to be 3D printed, if they're doing any new types of hardware designs uh, or, or, or lathed activity, um, you know, those get kicked off on the, on the Monday morning, sorry, on the Sunday morning, and then um, we normally have pitch coaches come in for the business teams to work with on the Sunday uh, in preparation for the for the uh, uh, presentations and 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 that's where you were the the judge at at the da airport hackathon yes so there's a hell of a lot of preparation i suppose and and as you said don't don't bring a knife to a gunfight no you you have to make sure you've got the right equipment yeah uh, when you 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 show up yeah you definitely want to make sure that you you have the right kit uh uh to to let the 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 participants play um if 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 they don't have the right kit ready, then they're not going to be successful at the end. Because I was going to ask you, right? So so in the shoes of a participant, so if I show up, right? One of the first things I, I thought is, okay, how do I pre prepare? Because ideally, I might get a few mates or a few buddies or somebody from a meetup group and kind of go, let's let's put a team together and go there. Yeah, that'd be uh, for me. That's the way I'd approach it. And kind of go, okay, if we do that, we'll do a bit of preparation. We'll do a brainstorm before we go in. But when you go in, are teams put together, or they, do they form themselves? Well, there are professional hacking teams, um, and we try to discourage them from coming because it is like having a bunch of professionals walking around. Um, that might be good if there's a if there's a focused hackathon uh, event for or, or mini hackathon, as you're saying. You know, you you, you want to be able to hire them uh, uh, for for that particular purpose, uh, but. But for these types of open events, um, ideation is good a bit beforehand. If you have your mates with you, um, you might want to bring them. But when you get there, you know, you may decide to split up um, between a few different teams because a lot of times, you know, your mates and yourself have the same function mm. expertise, right? You might all be software programmers. You might all be cloud programmers. You might all be hardware geeks, right, or business folks or or art people, right? But when but when you get there, you really have to divide up uh, in order to be successful. Um, you you might bring some some amount of commonality uh, to the event. You may even have some of the some some of the bits and pieces pre-planned. Like if you know we're we're going to be using a Microsoft cloud or an IBM cloud, uh, you may have played with that already, so that you're a bit more familiar with it. Now we'll do trainings on the Saturday for the for the teams who who were there in case they're not familiar with some of the kit which we're bringing forward to kind of help them we'll also have hardware engineers and software engineers standing ready to help with the design and and maybe you know give a push on the execution to make sure that the teams will be successful at the end of the day
you get a lot of, uh, out of it as a participant. I mean, if you're getting pitch coaching, you're getting you know mentorship. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's a hell of a lot of, and there's a small fee to enter, isn't there? Yeah, like it, it, it's nominal, and 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 the only reason we put that out there is because you know we don't want people just to sign up and not show up. Yeah, or drop um, offs. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you know, twenty or forty euro will normally you know put people's feet in. But but you you do get the training. You do get free food. I mean, yeah. and, and and it's not just pizza. Yeah. yeah, we do supply pizza on a Saturday night, but <laughs> but there's but there's decent food, yeah. you know, for for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for yeah. for those nights. Like we've had homeless guys come from from Cork uh, to participate, uh, and, which is fantastic. And you know they're 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 paying their own way on, wow. on the train, you know. Because do you know what I love? I love that Pete, because you know if you're thinking of some smart city stuff or some agricultural stuff that that you might be hacking on, I mean. Every mind counts because everybody sees the world from different places. And Absolutely. Go back to what you said about the pre-prepared team who may all be har- hardware geeks or software geeks that they don't, you don't get that magical mix of disciplines and focus, different yeah. focus, because that's when the stuff happens, real magic happens. The few times where, where we've let those teams go, they haven't done very well. They, ha- they, they haven't performed very well. Um, there was there was one with with, with, with DCC. You, could, you you could tell there was a bunch of mates sitting at the table, right? And uh, they weren't really focused. They were they, they they were doing you know what they do, but they weren't focused on the end goal, and and they weren't bringing all the pieces together that they they needed to be successful on the weekend. Um, and uh, I think they 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 kind of you know lost an opportunity there. I mean, I'm I'm sure they had a good time, but they didn't walk away with a, a few thousand quid in their pocket. Yeah. Because there is, I mean, every time you you attack a question or a, a problem for for the client, essentially, you're learning yourself. And you're if you, if you're in a mixed discipline team, you're going to see the world a little bit from their shoes. And but I, I love the what you said about the getting the training on the pitching as well, because the pitching often lets a lot of people down. And and that kind of leads me to the question: So, do you see much drop off rate? Because when you have a hackathon. Some people will just go, you know, or I, I, they might lose faith in their idea, or they might go, you know, I, 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 I want to go on a Sunday or something. I just want to do the Saturday. Do you see much of that? No, you don't. To be honest, that's you might, great. You, you might see people on a Friday who don't get their ideas picked. You know, they may, they may go home. Yeah. Um, uh, it's like it's my ball. I'm going. yeah. I'm going. I'm taking my ball and going <laughs> yeah. home. But, but that's okay. Um, there was. There's only. It's got to be less than ten percent uh, dropout. To be honest, there was and um, at at the airport hackathon, for instance, there was there was there was a, a team of folks who were there on the Friday, there on the Saturday, and then something happened, and a bunch of them dropped off, and there was only one guy, you know, there on the Sunday to pitch, and he wasn't the person who was supposed to pitch, but he stood there and he pitched. He didn't do half bad, considering that that wasn't his forte, and he wasn't exactly a public speaker, but. It was it was a credible pitch at the end of the day, and I think he got a lot out of it besides a standing ovation, hmm. right? So, um, yeah, that's great. And imagine for his confidence. I mean, you can't buy that. Yeah, well, no. Well, you can if you pay your thirty thirty euro nominal fee. No, but there's there's, I would say, especially some of the students from DCU who've attended, um, you you get to know them over time, and um, you know, I, I have an electrical engineering degree, you know, back. From, from back in the day, but you don't get that level of experience in the classroom, right? This really does round out um, some of some of what they're being taught. And you can actually see them progress, you know, hackathon over hackathon over hackathon um, to, to the point where, you know, they they have the equivalent of a, of, of a few years of, of education or um, I would say work experience under their belt from these little events that are going off. So um, I think... Uh, between what DCU is doing in the community and what they're offering for their courses, and then uh, with with the innovation campus, this is like icing on the cake for, yeah. for what's being offered. Because I, I was out, I, I visited Ronan Furlong out um, before when it was just a, a shell, the building, and yeah. uh, he he painted this vision, and it's just so good to see it flourishing. And when you saw the hackathon, you saw 
you know, the, the startups there that are actually working there Monday to Friday. It's just, or actually Monday to Monday. Yeah, Monday to Monday. <laughs> yeah. they, they, they rarely take yeah. any time yeah. off except to sleep. Yeah, but it's great. And the energy in the place is just fantastic. And that was the, the, the building is just brought back to life. And so you have some hackathons coming up, uh, Pete. Let's talk about that because hopefully, you know, some of the listeners may get involved or may have some ideas and, and the themes that uh, the hack, of the hacks coming up. Yeah, well, I can I can talk about two of them. Okay, for um, sure. Yeah. The others they they don't yeah. want to announce yet for for whatever reason. Yeah, sure. Uh, to keep people in suspense, I think. Um, but for uh, for September coming up, we have um, something called the the Biopharma Ambition Hackathon, which is ahead of the Biopharma Ambition Conference, um, which might sound like it's just a pharmaceutical industry getting together, uh, but actually it's it's more focused on healthcare and improving healthcare. In, in Ireland from the bench to the bedside. Um, now there's a website that you can go to and you can Google it, Biopharma Ambition, it's one word. Um, but MIT uh, Hacking Health, or Hacking Medicine, I should say, is going to be one of the uh, participants. As well, we have um, Intel and Microsoft, who from a multinational company perspective, are uh, helping to uh, contribute some of the, some of the kit and, and, and cloud to the event. Um, it's okay. going to run from the 16th to the 18th of September. Also, we have a few uh, startups uh, coming to the event that are putting their own uh, resources as as mentors for hardware and software. In, in FirmWave, that's a great little startup on the south side here, and uh, Emutex, who's coming out from Limerick, uh, who who knows quite a bit about IoT and, and gateway activities. So I was going to ask you that because so we've had a, a few health tech, um, med tech companies on, on the show Um can they show up for that? Yeah, like, yeah brilliant. So it's, it's a way of actually getting recognized as well. Yeah. So there's different ways that, that med tech companies can, can come in, right? They can, you know, provide uh, uh, mentorship for the participants and, you know, bounce around like a bee from flower to flower to flower, making sure that the right ideas are being used um, and, and people aren't, aren't going off, you know, half cocked with, with bad assumptions. Uh, so so, you're, so it needs a validation. And, and that's what some of these companies can bring to, to bear. Um, also, um, if, if there's a great idea that needs to be brought to market, then these are the companies that can help to bring them to market. Um, maybe not directly, maybe as, as, as part sponsor, but there's different activities there that those companies can, can, uh, can participate in. Yeah, and I was, just, I was actually just thinking as you're saying that like the people who may want to get into that area yeah. in the, their career, so students and maybe somebody who's looking, in, in, looking for a career. If, yeah, if, it's a great look, way to get in. If somebody's it? looking for a job, yeah. right, if you show up at one of these events, I guarantee you that there's mentors and companies and, and there's oodles of opportunity to network right, um, and show off a bit and get to know what's going on. Um, you, you actually get to know a lot of, of, of the ecosystem that you wouldn't normally see, right? Again, a lot of people wind up being pigeonholed in their little spot in their business, right? And, and they don't get the opportunity to look outside even temporarily um, from a professional's point of view. This does offer that, that, that mix, right, of, of learning and professional uh, activity all, all in, in, in the weekend. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a... <laughs> It's a no-brainer, isn't it? I want to say free education, but but it is, isn't it? it is. I mean, it's just I mean, any experience. I, I was I was told that as a kid, never say no to an invite, yeah. never say no to a new experience because yeah. it will just give you a different way of look, different lenses. W- and I would look at the world. And and I would say if there's any of those uh, healthcare bio, biomed companies that are hiring or wanting to hire, come to the event. You know, set up set up a stand, um, take resumes in. This could be easily turned yeah. into a job fair because it, it I was like it's a no brainer because you're seeing how they interact with people, how they inter- work in a team, yeah. how they present if they get to present, yeah. and like it's an absolute no brainer. So, so that's the bio pharma one. What, what have you any others coming up? Yeah, there's there's say? there's one for energy that's being sponsored by a very large public company, okay, with three letters in it um, <laughs> that. Uh, actually has to come out to my house and and and, and install some electricity uh, shortly. Okay. Um, please, God, come fast uh, so I can move back into my house. Um, but Pete's uh, building a house, by the way, so <laughs> your time is much appreciated, Pete. The um, thanks. The uh, the uh, energy uh, hackathon is, is going to be about what to do around smart homes 
and and business uh, to to make them greener. Um, the ideas are still being put together, and the problem statements are still being put together. There's there's a large potential there uh, to to bring in uh, various partners as well. Um, so that's still shaping up. That's going to be held most likely in October time frame, uh, and then there's there's others that are coming up in November and December, um, and that doesn't count the ones that are coming forward in uh, 2017. But uh, we we could do this every weekend. But the problem is, it's it's it really does drain you. Um, you you can't do it every weekend. I, I, I honestly think once a once a month is kind of pushing it, um, both from the sponsor's point of view and the participants' point of view. Um, you 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 want to be able to space it out a, a, a bit. Yeah, because there's, there's work to be done afterwards. I mean, it's it's not it's like going to a meeting and then having some actions out of that meeting in, in a big way. Because oh, yeah. if you're done your job right, you, you've probably got years or plus worth of work or activities yes. to happen out of it. Yeah, and then. And then you have to think about the the commercialization aspect. If it's something which you want to bring commercially, whether it be uh, private or or public, right? That has to be thought through, and and you have to have the people who are doing it uh, uh, or, or or contributing to it at, at the beginning to to have that continuity and and that technology transfer happen. Um, so there there is follow up activities that that are scheduled for a few months after. Um, I would I would say that you know we could do a better job at at driving that forward, um, but that's something which you're going to be looking at yeah. for, for for this year. Okay, and so Pete, where where can people find out information on an ongoing basis for hacks coming in the line and stuff like that? Yeah, um, well, DCU has a website dcualpha.ie, um, and you can look up under the events uh, tag there. Um, and it will list out a, a few of them. The Biopharma Ambition one is coming up on the 16th through the 18th. Uh, we have an ESB hackathon, which is going to go into energy uh, needs for the country, uh, as well as smart home, smart business. And that's going to be in October time frame. And then going forward in November, we have a blockchain hackathon, uh, which is coming up as well. Um, looking forward into 2017, uh, we, ha- we were thinking about things like fish and the fisheries of Ireland. Um, and then uh, we're probably going to be rolling back through uh, the fashion um, industry and then back to health uh, before uh, we round out the season in uh, May and June. Brilliant. That's a big mix of stuff coming up there. So yeah. um, dcualpha.ie and check on the events section. Pete Dice, Technical Director with DCU Alpha. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Aidan. Dolly Gall Hills of eyes. <laughs> <laughs> they do. The lights, man. <laughs> Good to go. Okay, so welcome to the show, co-founders of VStream Group, Andrew Jenkinson and Neil O'Driscoll. Welcome to the show, guys. Great to be here. Thanks. Thank you. So, uh, Neil, we'll start with you. Tell us about the, the genesis of VStream Group. What, how did you build the company? What stages did you go through, etc.? cetera? Uh, well, we founded the company in 2007. It was myself and Andrew. Uh, we're uh, childhood friends. We went to school together, met when we were nine years old. Um, on the steps of our school in Belvedere. And I walked out one day and found this guy uh, standing on the steps eating what I'd never seen before was a, a crisp sandwich. I was from the south side, he was from the north side, so I'd never seen this. I asked him what he was doing. He explained to me this uh, this thing, the crisp sandwich. And that was really where where, uh, where we first I was first introduced to innovation. And then 2007, we, uh, we got a couple of SSIAs uh, and formed our company with two employees. Uh, and then... Nine years later, we now have three companies as part of that group, uh, and we're also launching a new platform in the States called The Cube. That's brilliant. So it's good to see the SSIA going to use as well, not buying a car or, or some uh, fancy holiday or a house in Bulgaria not, at the well, time. Well, not, not yet. You know, <laughs> not yet. It's a long time coming, yeah. So you guys uh, love to do World's First. You've done the World's First interactive HD video website, World's First personalized 3D fan experience, personalized 5D experience, gesture-controlled holograms, augmented reality, indoor fan experiences, transparent interactive fan experiences. So you you love innovation is at the heart of the company and you have a beautiful new product the cube as well which we'll, we'll talk about in a second but um andrew 
let's talk about the innovation part of the, the company because we, we talk about innovation on the show as not being a linear process and something that you discover by getting your hands dirty. Can we talk about that for a second? Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of one of uh, one of the my favorite phrases uh, to describe an entrepreneur is somebody who uh, you know who jumps off a cliff and builds a plane on the way down. And in a many in a many ways, that's how we operate in the VStream Group. Innovation has always been at the the core of what we do. Uh, it's our differentiator, um, but it's expensive. Uh, it's time consuming and it's uncertain. So it's very difficult to build a business that uh, you know is 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 founded on on the unknown. Um, but it's a uh, it's a really really exciting space to be in. So what we like to do is look at new platforms, new technologies, new ways of engaging with audiences. So uh, with our platform, the Cube, that's all about the fan experience in the stadium. We launched that at Super Bowl Fifty. We have a huge. Um, a huge backing from Enterprise Ireland, and this makes it really, really uh, easy for us to to justify the amount of time, uh, effort, and f- and funds that go into uh, go into innovation. So, with the R and D grant funding that we have uh, through Enterprise Ireland, we're able to really spend a significant amount of our time um, just experimenting and trying out new technologies, be it virtual reality, be it wearables, be it holograms, be it all of these different types of new platforms, and then that really allows us to become uh, um, uh, to, to come first to the market with these solutions. So our client list includes Formula One teams, Premiership teams, um, the NFL, the Super Bowl, these massive brands that are really looking for something different. So um, it's a it's it's a, a, a difficult space to be in sometimes, uh, but extremely rewarding when you when you get it right. Yeah, because it's funny because when you look at the advertising ecosystem at the moment and the rise of ad blocking, etc., brands. And people are looking for more and more for experiences and they're investing in those experiences. Yeah. And it's almost like your community will then benefit. So if I'm a brand, I'll create a community around a certain theme or a certain hobby and then give my, my audience that experience. And that's what you guys really excel at. Can you give us an example of, of that, Neil? Sure, yeah. Well, um, I suppose one of the recent ones was with McLaren Formula One. Uh, SAP came to us and asked us to uh, activate their sponsorship of McLaren. Um, and a lot of the time within this, uh, as you said, the, the brand association is very important. Um, you can put logos into various different places, but it's not really activating and telling the story. And especially with a company like SAP, it's a complex B two B sort of a, 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 a sort of a, a product and service. So we were uh, asked to create an experience within the McLaren Technology Center to activate SAP's sponsorship. Now, the McLaren Technology Center is like a James Bond's villain lair. It's an amazing, most expensive privately owned building uh, in the world. It's in Woking outside London. And it's subterranean, built on a lake, and the lake cools the building. And that's where they they, uh, build all the sports cars, and they have a huge amount of innovation in there. SAP were given a, a space right at the heart of that, and they asked us to create an experience within that. So SAP and McLaren meet in a, basically where the products meet is in a, a place called Mission Control. So when the cars are racing around the world in real time, the data, 250 sensors on the car, send data back to this room and aerodynamicists and strategists all look at that data and work out what's the best way to win that race. So we took this space and built a new version of it, a, futurist, a futuristic version. So we looked at it and said, what would future engineers need? So we said, let's, let's create better visualization of the data and let's make it more intuitive. And so we created the gestural hologram. So the data is represented in a hologram and you can move that hologram around using gestures. Very, very much like a lot of what you've seen in, uh, in Iron Man and films like that. So that created the core for these VIP guests. And then we went on to use a, to kind of create the journey uh, right down to using augmented reality glasses, um, multi-touch tables where you put a, an object on the table. It recognizes the object. And then you use the object to interact with the content. So it meant that we were telling the story of data for SAP from lots of different points of view. But we're using all of these different elements of McLaren steering wheels or what it's like to be in mission control or what it's like to be pit side at a race to tell that story. And out of that um, experience, we, we were able to develop a lot of products which we're now using uh, in other experiences as well. Man, but that is really, really is, is how experiential works. Yeah, so and just to get it clear, so that, that the relationship between SAP and, mm. and McLaren, it was a data one. So it was the sensors on the car, in a way... IOT, so Internet of Things, it was like sending back sensors to improve the experience in in real time where they could make in real time decisions to win races, essentially. And you took that 
and you made it into an experience. Is that experience for the data scientists to 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 engage, or is that actually a fan experience as well? It's a VIP fan experience. I got you. Okay. Yeah. So all of their all of SAP's guests that are brought to the McLaren Technology Center for a tour. Uh, are brought down to this space and they experience this. Uh, and in doing so, they learn more about what SAP actually does and especially what they do for McLaren. But now it's extended to all the guests that go through McLaren Technology Center. But it is a VIP experience in this instance. Yeah. However, we did take that and create an online version as well. Um, so we created a, a kind of a dynamic website um, and that was for fans um, and, and for the wider wider McLaren audience. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was... That worked really, really well. Had uh, very, it was very sticky, so it had a, a lot of people went onto the site and stayed on the site for a long time. Um, and every month, uh, every race, they would come back and they would uh, have more content that they could engage with. But ultimately, when you arrived at the site, it looked like Mission Control Two, that space that we created. It looked like that, and you could could engage with it online. Yeah, and the the beauty of what you guys have done is you don't treat each project in isolation. It's like, okay, how can I build a template or a certain kind of intellectual property out of that project that the company, the Vstream Group, owns, and then how can I reuse that in lots of other places? And y- you often don't see that coming from agencies, creative agencies, where they treat everything like a one-off project and they don't productize the offering every time. And you guys have done that really well. Your latest product, product Andrew, is the Cube. Um, it looks fantastic. Can we talk about that and, and let the audience know what that is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think you know the uh, the point you just made there about the the innovation, uh, productizing, and, and and spinning out um, as a, as a traditionally services business. This is something that we were, were really keen on doing to ultimately uh, you know resolve in a, um, a, a a platform that we can productize and, and and grow. So we've done a huge amount of work in the sporting uh, arena and in uh, in retail and entertainment um, where there's high footfall and uh, a real need to engage with fans. Uh, we've done, you know, really nice um, uh, engagement for the Aviva Stadium here. A lot of our business is international, um, but we've done quite some quite interesting stuff here. And we did a big fan engagement piece for the Aviva Stadium. McLaren that Neil talked about, Mercedes Formula One team, Premiership teams, etc. And for each of those engagements, we've had to sort of um, specify hardware, specify an installation, literally build into the fabric of the stadium and then create the experience. So um, we, we realized that, you know, a significant amount of the client's budget was going on stuff, on screens, on computers, on, on, on engineers and on building, uh, where the end result, the experience itself and the, the content was, uh, was, was, was getting a smaller piece of the pie. So we wanted to solve that problem by building a platform. Uh, and the platform we created is called the Cube. So it's a, a multi-sided and multi, um, uh, uh, multi-sized multi uh, interactive platform. So it comes in a large format, which is a 2.3 meter uh, cubed uh, installation. Uh, it's made of, out of transparent OLED screens. So it basically means you can see through these screens to inside the Cube and you can place a person, a trophy, a car, whatever you like inside this Cube. The Cube is interactive. Interactive. It's touchscreen. It's gesture controlled. You can interact with it uh, through a mobile platform. And then we have uh, person-sized uh, pillars, which are also interactive, and then small mini cubes that go on tabletops. So the idea is that basically this platform, which we launched at Super Bowl 50 this year, which is in Levi's Stadium in San Francisco, is installed in the stadium. Um, the stadium then uh, has this as a, uh, a another asset to sell to their sponsors. The sponsors have a platform that they can create a really engaging experience on, and agencies like ourselves uh, can create really interesting interesting content without the necessity of creating and building uh, a, a new new hardware and software solutions. So the Cube launched um, this year uh, at Super Bowl 50 and our plan is now to uh, to install across a significant number of stadia in the US and create this network effect. So the idea is that the 49ers are playing in Levi's Stadium on, uh, on, on a Sunday and there's an activation uh, for one of their sponsors on the Cube where you can interact with Pepsi, let's say. The next weekend, Taylor Swift is playing a concert. So Live Nation create an activation on the cube where their fans can interact with uh, with with her content, and as that as that tour travels around the uh, the US or the rest of the world, all of the cubes that are located at the stadia that that she may play at or uh, that the teams may play at uh, are, are are available to to activate those uh, those sponsorships. So. 
We've had great interest um, from a, a number of uh, major sports organizations um, and our, our kind of launch at Super Bowl 50 was a, a fantastic win. Uh, it got the uh, visibility of some serious players in the tech industry. And when your technical director is shaking hands with Elon Musk at the end of uh, Super Bowl Sunday, you know, it's been a, you know, it's been a good day. So so we're really excited about the uh, the future of the Cube and, uh, and, and where it might bring us. Yeah, I'd love to talk about. Um, so we've talked about the products, talked about the company, but now your process so how, how does an idea come to this mouth of the funnel and how do you treat that is, is it is it based on a need of the client or is it based on an opportunity you see in the in the ecosystem how does that work and how do you th- then work together to deliver that product uh, well, a lot of the time, um, you know, we, we've grown this, the, we've grown everything we've done organically, you know, so we had that initial investment. And so we take briefs and we respond to those briefs. That's how it's always worked. Uh, however, you know, more and more we have been, the briefs we've been given are fairly open. So that's given us an opportunity to be very inventive um, and to basically develop whatever IP that we see or whatever concept that we see. So the Cube, for example, came from a need actually that uh, that Westfield had and they, they said, look, we need something you know, at the center of our, where they used to have the, the fountain or the clock tower in the center of the of the shopping center. Uh, we need something there, but that is futuristic, that allows people to kind of come together, interact, links our offline, online worlds together, can be seen from every single point of view, including a mezzanine. Uh, and, and they said, you know, what, what could you do? And actually, we developed that concept, the cube, from that. And that's where that first idea came from. Uh, a lot of the time, um, we'll be given a brief and you know, we'll be aware of what technology we have or what technology is out there, what technology we might be able to bring together. Uh, and it, it often starts with me in a notebook and a, a bunch of colored biros kind of coming up with a load of sketches. Um, and then uh, and I'll bring that to Andrew and I'll say, so let's let's make this. And that's very, you know, just colored, colored biros and mm-hmm. not practical whatsoever. And then Andrew will look at it and go, right, well, how would we do that? <laughs> and get out, get out. <laughs> yeah, so I'll, I'll tell him why it's a great idea. And then he has to actually kind of yeah. actually make it work. Um, so I'm able to come, you know, dream up things yeah. and then he actually makes them happen. And that's normally the way the way it works. That's but l- luckily we have uh, we have uh, a team of people more skilled than either of us now that, that do the do the doing and the making and the creating of things. So, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, that's very it's not, it's not just us. It's very important. We understand also the skill sets that our team have and the things that they're thinking and they're working on as well. So we're kind of. You know, whenever I think about uh, a concept, I'm thinking about everything that we're all talking about at the yeah. same time. So all those ideas are floating around the ecosystem and kind of uh, we'll get a brief and I'll try and bring it all together into a, into a response. And then Andrew will try and make that happen and bring the team together to execute. So you guys are really working on the business and the team is working in the business essentially to deliver. Uh, well, the, we're, we're, we have still have one foot, one foot in and one foot on, if yeah. you know what I mean. But yeah. um, more and more as the years have gone on, we're, we focus more and more on the business and we have a large your team that uh, that works in the business yeah. so one last thing is culture how, how what kind of culture do you foster for, for innovation because it seems like you, like even the way you guys are talking it's very inclusive you know it's not just you two guys in an ivory tower going let's build this you know blueprint uh, the next crisp sandwich you're actually <laughs> looking you're actually including the team how do you foster that that innovate, innovative culture yeah well well it's uh you know the type of the type of team that we have and the to, the type of talent that that you know an organization like the v stream group needs to attract um you have to have a culture that is uh is synonymous with innovation is um uh, facilitates making mistakes facilitates uh, all sorts of crazy ideas, crazy working hours, uh, you know, travel to different places to look at different things and, uh, and really, you know, giving people the, um, the, the, the belief that, um, even though it's never been done before, doesn't mean it can't be done. Um, and, uh, and, and, and we actually, you know, the philosophy internally is there's no such thing as it can't be done. There's, there's always a way. So we, we try to really give people, um, you know, the, the, the framework in which to, 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 to give their capabilities the best opportunity to succeed. Um, we have a, um, we, our, our software developers are, are scientists. They're not traditional software developers. They're soldering irons and screwdrivers and all sorts of things sitting around the place where 
where people are literally breaking apart hardware components, gluing them to other hardware components to figure out how that might work. Um, and sometimes we have very standard briefs for really cool clients, but they just want something that we have done before. And in that case, it's very important for us to give a little bit of time to, for people to just play, to just experiment, to just go and have a, 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 a go at some new technology. And a lot of the time, that's where the innovation culture comes from is, is uh, it's not all timesheets for people to be, uh, you know, working on billable hours. There's a very clear mandate for people to bring new ideas in, uh, to educate and cross pollinate the creative team on what's technically possible. The creative team talking to the technical guys about we have this idea and it's never been done before. How might it get done? Um, and then, you know, to be able to, you know, have the the the, the real honor uh, from myself and Neil's perspective to bring this, you know, this ideation internationally and. and and, and launch it on some of the largest sporting stages or, or, or brand stages in the world. Um, and all of it uh, from a, an innovation point of view and pr- from a productivity point of view happens domestically. It's all, uh, it's all, uh, it's all Irish exports. Uh, we have an office in, in New York and we have an office in London, but the vast majority of everything that we do happens in our headquarters and in, in, uh, just off Leeson Street. Uh, and that's a, a, a great source of pride as well, that this type of innovation is happening on our, uh, in our home turf and, uh, you know, and reaching reaching out to, 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 to crowds in the US and, and, and globally. Neil O'Driscoll, Andrew Jenkinson, co-founders of Vstream Group, thank you very much. Thank Cheers. you. Thank you. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Aidan McCullen. Find us on the innovationshow.io.